Thank you very much, yeah. So uh, we were talking about Quest earlier, right? So making the uh, internet a safer place is, you know, as good a place as any to, to start, I think. Um, so yeah, so in our lab, basically, we try to do stuff around risk, safety, security, trying to make the internet a safer place. What I'm going to talk to you about today specifically is hate speech and cyber hate. So how many of you here use online social networks? About 75%. How many of you would know how to engage with cyber hate if you came across it to try and kind of remedy it? About four people. Great. So I got a job. That would have been a short talk otherwise. So <laughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we define it, uh, how we measure it, how we observe it then, given that we're uh, you know, research scientists, um, and how we can manage it. And the real takeaway for you guys, hopefully, will be, that will be the management. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is distinguish between hate crime and cyber hate. So hate crime is enshrined in law. So in the UK, we have the Public Order Act, which basically uh, has strict thresholds which need to be passed for something to be a crime. Now, this is based on protected characteristics, race, religion, sexual orientation, and so on. Um, but for something to be a crime, it actually needs to have either uh, uh, an incitement element to it or, or an active threat. <clears throat> now, that to us doesn't seem all that suitable for uh, managing something like the internet. It's too big. Too many people on it, and there's too much stuff out there at the moment, as I'm sure you've seen. So our take on this is that if we're going to measure something, we need to measure something that can be understood by everyone. So we take a harms perspective. Basically, if somebody can be harmed by it, then it's cyber hate. That's our take on it. Now, these things tend to be triggered by things like Brexit, the Westminster attack, President Trump, we're going to build a wall. Mexico is going to pay for it, right? These things tend to lead to a reaction, an online reaction, an online reaction targeting people with protected characteristics. Uh, following the 9-11 attacks, the offline hate crimes recorded, 58% of those happened within two weeks. So we've got to be able to react to this quickly, and this is offline. So imagine online. We need to be able to measure this quickly and in real time. Okay? So what we're essentially looking for is to measure antagonistic and hateful language online. Now, you all put your hands up for using online social networks. Most people now use online social networks. Now, when you're using them for good, which everyone is in here today, right? You're all promoting TEDx and all the speakers that are here today, yeah? So you're all using it for, for good and trying to get a positive message out there. It gives you this megaphone, right? It gives you this stage, this platform to be able to reach everyone, anywhere in the world that's got access to online social networks, which is now a large proportion. But unfortunately, it also gives a, a platform to people with uh, views that are hateful and are antagonistic and they want to express and they want to react to things you know, several people today have mentioned about how people react to things and people come bad, people get stressed, things like changes in politics and government, you know, they, they, they tend to lead to that. So we get these reactions. Now, this also then leads to echo chambers. And when cyber hate is out there, people tend to join in with this. And the longer it's out there for, and the more it gets propagated through these online social networks, it remains a problem. So our job is to measure this, better understand how to manage that type of problem. Now, all online social networks suffer with this, but we've particularly studied Twitter because it's so open and it's so highly connected. Um, what we've done is basically collected data from Twitter following one of these trigger events. In particular, this was uh, Woolwich uh, and, the, and the attack on Lee Rigby and Woolwich. And basically what we've done is we've asked people, is this hateful or antagonistic? Simple as that. Where people agree, we take that as then a gold standard. This is hateful or antagonistic. Now, one of the problems we face following you know, trigger events is that there's such a volume of reaction in online social media. We couldn't give each tweet out to every individual. It would take forever to annotate. So what we can do is train machines to recognize this, and recognize the features of cyber hate. And this is precisely what we've done. Now, um, how many of you have come across machine learning before? 
a handful. Basically, machine learning is recognizing the features that we as humans would look for to be able to identify something. So if I give you a basic example of uh, apples and bananas, right? One feature we might identify is the color. So we might train a machine to say if something's red or green, it's an apple, if something's yellow, it's a banana. There'll be occasions, of course, where you'll have green bananas and green apples, and then you get confused, so you'll have other features. Shape, for example. If it's round, it's an apple. Long and thin, it's a banana, right? So machine learning is basically identifying features that a machine can recognize and classify as something. In our case, cyber hate. So one of the obvious things we could have done is to look for derogatory terms. I'm sure you can all think of derogatory terms to, to people you could exhibit, um, that, who, towards people who exhibit protected, protected characteristics. We found this actually doesn't work all that well. The reason being is on inspecting some of these tweets that we had annotated, we actually identified there was a much more nuanced antagonism in here. I'm sure you've all come across it. It's this message of us and them, not here, go home, not welcome, okay? Now that doesn't always work with words themselves. So what we've actually done is to start look at, uh, looking at probabilistic language models, which I won't go into, but essentially what they're looking for is co-occurring terms like go back, not welcome, go home, us and them. And they look for the ones that are probabilistically likely to occur in cyber hate as opposed to general everyday language. So what we found is that, that using this method allows us to be around about 80% accurate at classifying something as cyber hate, hateful or antagonistic language, which means that we can train the machine to basically do what a human would do. Because let's remember, humans aren't 100% accurate either. During this annotation exercise, it was normally about 75% of the time that people agreed as to whether something is hateful or antagonistic. So now that we can actually do this, we can do it at scale. So following an event, we can take all the data that comes in around the event and study it. So following the attack in Woolwich, this is precisely what we did. What we wanted to know was, how viral does hate speech go? And we measured statistically how likely different elements, different features of the tweets, the statistical power of these elements in predicting whether they'd be retweeted or not. So we had things like whether they contain a hashtag, whether they contain a URL, who they were tweeted by. We looked at different media, media outlets, political groups, celebrities, number of followers. One of the elements in the model was cyber hate. Another element in the model was sentiment, positive or negative, a fairly you know, rough and ready type of measurement. For cyber hate, we know it was about 80% accurate. We hypothesized that following this attack, cyber hate would be highly likely to be retweeted. You would imagine it would. It was actually 45% less likely to be retweeted than a tweet that didn't contain cyber hate. So it was not spreading following this attack. That was supported by the sentiment measurement that actually told us that it was 24% more likely to be retweeted if it contained positive sentiment. This was messages of support, messages for the public leaders that came out and denounced the attack. Cyber hate didn't spread following this attack. We also looked at the longevity. How long does something stay out there for in the Twitter sphere? This is important because the longer it's out, the longer it's a risk that people will join on the bandwagon and create these echo chambers. Cyber hate died out within a day. We measured a two-week period. It died out very, very quickly. It didn't stay out there for very long. So contrary to what we, I guess, popular belief on online social networks, that they're kind of echo chambers of hate and antagonism, we measured it. We've seen it. It's there. Absolutely, it's there. Um, we can build networks around looking at who propagates that. But it doesn't spread far, and it doesn't spread long, which is a good thing. So this brings me to my uh, final bit, I guess, which is, which is how to manage this. Um, now, all the other stuff I've spoken to about so far is, 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 is kind of solid. We've, 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 you know, we're quite confident in this. this. This other stuff now we're starting to get into, and we're starting to get some findings around how to manage it. Now, what we did is we looked at threads on Twitter. So if you post a tweet and people reply to it, and they reply to it, and they reply to it, and they reply to it, and these can get quite long. So we looked following a cyber hate remark, 
how long these threads would get. And we measured, again, statistically, what were the factors that meant they'd end up as long threads or short threads. The idea being, can we see how it stemmed? Now, what we found was, if you go in there and call someone a keyboard warrior, absolutely lights a fire. The hate gets worse. It gets more extreme. It gets really, really very much longer, drawn out. If you go in there and call someone a racist, actually, they tend to stop. Validation. They've got what they came for. Well, what we also saw was that if this happens in small numbers, it kind of creates a, a bit of a hook for the person who's posted this original message to come back. You know, someone's kind of, uh, I maybe validated me, but someone else has said something else I can hook on. There's really no, not much point engaging in this at all. And the, the, the most useful remarks were just calls to order. You can't do that. It's not acceptable. Or requesting evidence when there isn't any evidence. But the most important finding is that the more people, individual people, who get involved in counter speech, in this thread, trying to stop it, trying to give a, a, a message that says this is unacceptable, the shorter the thread became. So essentially what we're seeing is sensible online community activism. So following the riots in London, right, this was an offline event, but people came out with their brushes and said, look, you know, we're still here. We're going to clean up. We're going to sort this out. You know, you're not going to beat us. This is in the offline world. But the online and the offline world can't be separated anymore. Right? When people are attacked online, they feel it in their person, and they feel it just in their homes, they don't want to go out of the house, they feel it when they go to work, they feel like everyone's looking at them. Just because something is online doesn't mean it doesn't affect them in the offline world. We live in an online and an offline world. Social cohesion is a very big problem at the moment, and cyber hate online is there and is available for anyone in the world to see. The web connects us all, so my final remark will be is you're all on online social media, so if you see it, work together, and you can stop it. Thank you very much.